13-year-old daughter, Carrie, was killed by a drunk driver. She was thrown 125 feet, and she was left in the road to die. The man who killed her was out on bail from another hit-and-run drunk driving crash. And I took that pain, rage, and grief and started the largest anti-drunk driving organization in the world. Now We Save Lives has expanded its efforts to include the three Ds, drunk, drugged, and distracted driving. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about her, that I don't miss her, and wonder what would have happened if that man were not driving on that particular day. Even though drunk driving is no longer socially acceptable, people are still doing it. This is a choice people make. This is not an accident, it's a crime. Chances are you know someone who's been affected by the three Ds, or you know someone that you can keep from driving drunk. This is Chip and Chat, the encouraging one another podcast, where it's all about encouragement. searching online for individuals to have a conversation with and talk with, I came across this individual. Today, I'll have the privilege and honor to have on a groundbreaking American traffic safety advocate, author, and spokesperson. Recognizing her years of dynamic leadership, the media voted her as one of the most influential American citizens of the 20th century. People Magazine call her the conscience of a nation, and books refer to her as the mother of movements. Candy Candace Leitner, founder of Mothers Against Driving Drunk, Mad, and We Save Lives, is recognized nationally and internationally as the moving force behind the reshaping of this nation's attitude toward drunk driving as well as drug and distracted driving. She found him mad after her 13-year-old daughter Carrie was killed by a multiple repeat offending drunk driver. Leitner has been credited with saving over 400,000 lives. And armed with her anger and passion, she set out to change the system of the prevailing attitude of the societal acceptance as most common um, crime committed in this country. The mother turned activist not only led the nation to movement, but made drunk driving socially unacceptable. She became a leading victim's advocate, teaching victims and survivors how to fight for justice in the courtroom. She is currently the founder and president of We Save Lives, an organization that offers a voice on highway safety issues focusing on the three Ds, drugged, drunk, and distracted driving, which we will discuss today. I'm excited to speak with her and to share her story about her organization that she is a part of. As always, I hope this interview will help encourage someone out there, perhaps inspire someone to not be afraid, to make a change, to stand up for what they believe. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest in extreme honor today, Candace Leitner. Good morning, Candace. Oh, hey, this is interesting. I've not done one of these. <laughs> anyway, uh, hi, how are you? I'm good, yourself? I'm okay. 
thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to join me today. No problem. Where are you located? California State. Oh, Washington State. Are you getting any of the um, issues from California? You know, sort of, you know, how one state gets impacted, but other states get, you know, residual issues. Are you? It's oh. rained consecutive days, so that's not, not a first around here, but... <laughs> yeah, no, it's not a first year. <laughs> sort of normal, <laughs> anyway. Well, I'm so, I'm so excited to talk to you today and get you kind of get your story and about your organization. And uh, thanks so much for being part of the Chit and Chat Encouraging One Other Podcast. Okay, well, I'm honored to um, to participate. Before we dive into some fun, questions, fun conversations, I'd like to ask five icebreaker questions. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as brought to you about Takiza, they have five kinds of tacos. So we have five little icebreaker questions. Do you like tacos, first of all? I do. Awesome. Is it a hot spot? You like to eat tacos in your neck of the woods? Well, I don't go to fast food places. Okay. So if I have tacos, I make them myself. Oh, mate. Right, right. Yeah. The best kind. And where are you at? I'm in Virginia. I DC. Okay. Uh, question number one, if you go anywhere in the world on a two-week vacation, where are you going and why? Okay, so if I were to go anywhere in the world, I would want to go to Lebanon because okay. it's uh, my family's home from back when. Mm -hmm. I'm second generation, and I've never been there. Oh, wow. So I would probably say Lebanon. Yeah. All right. Question number two. What are your three favorite foods? Oh, avocados, <laughs> strawberries, and cantaloupe. Oh, I like, yeah, I like some cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, question number three is kind of a two-parter. Mm -hmm. What two things do you consider yourself very good at and two things you're not so good at? <laughs> okay. What two things? I good at i'm good yep. at uh let's see if i can think of the right word i'm 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 good at okay so which is a broad category but i am i'm really good at activism and i'm passionate about activism the second thing i'm good at is oh, i really not that great at knitting but i love to knit <laughs> let's see the second thing oh this is what everybody I'm good at uh, like staging, design, decor, um, and I, I get that from other people. So I'm going to say that's the second thing I'm good at. Two things I'm not good at are knitting, which I love, <laughs> and um, cooking, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> that's very. My, my grandma did a lot of Afghans when I was growing up, so she made a lot of Afghans. I, I don't have any ability to sew at all, so that's, I'm never good at sewing. <laughs> but do you have any? that she made? Uh, I do believe so. Yeah, quilts. She makes up quilts and Afghans for my kids. Oh, lucky you. They're lucky all adults you. now, so I think that's a gift. It's, that's, a, that's a talent that's kind of gone away is, is quilting and making Afghans, I think. Mm -hmm. Actually, you would think, but it really is still there and very prevalent. Did you know that Julia Roberts is a passionate knitter, and I actually used to knit with her when I lived in California briefly. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, there are a lot of people that do. You just don't hear it. Okay. Uh, another passionate knitter whom I also knew was Loretta Swit. And okay. she, she from Mesh and she actually developed patterns and um, you know, actually made a business out of it. So That's you know it's cool. still around. Yeah. All right, question number four. What uh what's what's fall season do you love best? Summer, fall, winter, or spring? You know, <laughs> because I have allergies <laughs> <laughs> taints my view here. Uh Fall, probably fall. Okay. And finally, last question. What is the best piece of advice you've ever gotten from somebody and who was it from? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. I honestly don't have a clue. Okay. Okay. No problem. Mm -hmm. For some of my listeners out there who might not know who you are, can you give us a brief bio about yourself? kind of where you grew up and in our conversation we'll talk, talk more in the detail about the things you've been involved in over your uh, your, your career mm -hmm. so i'm air force brat military brat and ex-wife 
I spent, I tell everybody, I was born in the military, raised in the military, married in the military, divorced in the military, and retired after 32 years of active service. <laughs> um, and I've lived all over. I've lived uh, not in very many states, California predominantly where I was born in Arizona, I think are the only two states I really lived in. The rest of the time was out of country, you know, Okinawa and Guam and France and Germany and whatever. So um, so I've lived all over and traveled all over, not everywhere, but done a great deal of travel. And um, after my divorce, and I had three children, twins, uh, Carrie and Serena and my son, Travis. And so in 1980, um, my Twin daughter, Carrie, who was 13 at the time, was killed by a multiple repeat offender, hit and run drunk driver. And as a result of her death and the lack of action being taken on drunk driving, I started mad and uh, changed, and I'm getting this from other people, but changed the culture of a nation. Mm -hmm. And so that drunk driving is no longer socially acceptable and then left mad and went on to do some other things, including writing a book called Giving So how to cope with grief and get on with your life. And I wrote that book because after I left MAD, a number of people thought that I should have been done with my grieving. And I thought, boy, is that not right? Yeah. And because of the five myths or the myths about the five stages of grieving, which Elizabeth Tubler Ross wrote, but it was about the five stages of dying and not grieving over somebody's death. And I wanted to show that that wasn't Correct. And the book breaks it down into three stages, the beginning, the middle, and the rest of your life. And it's a beautiful book. It's a sharing of stories of people who have um, lived through grief. And it's about all different types of grief in terms of death. It covers AIDS and when a parent dies, murder, etc. In fact, it was the first book that we know of that was actually prominently displayed in gay bookstores because we covered the topic of AIDS. And I actually went and stayed with um, families of gay people etc. And um, and then I did consulting and then in I think it was 2014, I started We Save Lives, which focuses on drunk, drugged and distracted driving. And I started that because A, I had a number of highway safety advocates and government workers, etc. asked me if I would come back into the movement because they felt the movement needed some strength and some activism. And two, because as drugged and distracted driving were becoming uh, real problems, but they weren't addressed in a public way. And um, I had been working for a company that dealt with drugged driving, and I became very passionate about it and distracted. And so I decided I wanted to do something on the three Ds, drunk, drugged, and distracted driving. And that's what We Save Lives is. It's a partner organization. We have about 40 or 50 partners from all over um who share our goals and views and mission statement and in fact we have a really exciting project coming up and that is national passenger safety week which starts on the 22nd which is something i've been trying to do for several years and the national road safety foundation was kind enough to partner with me on it because they believed in passenger safety too mm -hmm. and so we launched our first national passenger safety week last and this year we're um, launching our second. Wow. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you? We'll go back to like a little bit. When you, when you decided I had to do something after your daughter was, was killed by this driver, was there a time frame where you like, I got to do something? And how did MAD come about? So um, it was a hit and run, and the man was arrested. She was killed May 3rd. I think he was arrested May 7th. And so when I found out after he was arrested that he was a multiple repeat offender drunk driver um, who was still driving on a valid California driver's license when he killed my daughter, it was then. So it was on the 7th, right after she died. Wow. So it was within a few days. And I was reading about you'd never organized anything before. And you created one of the biggest organizations in the world. <laughs> That's amazing. at that time it was. Now it's okay. not. Yeah, okay. it was. 
It was the first grassroots, it was the first national grassroots organization. And it really, it's no longer grassroots, as you know, and it's no longer volunteer, but at that time it really was. And so um, it was the first of its kind. There was another organization called RID, Remove Intoxicated Drivers, but they were based in New York. And I reached out to them and asked them if we could become RID. And they said, no, they didn't want to do that then because they really wanted to stay local, which was fine. And so, you know, I went ahead and did my own thing and started mad. And I read you, you faced some difficulties when creating this organization. Was that just politics or what kind of, what kind of pushback did you get when you were trying to create mad? I didn't get any pushback from mad. Okay. okay. Um, back in, in terms of legislation but uh, i didn't get, you yeah. know sorry oh, yeah. yeah i mean starting mad was just you know setting up a corporation etc so um you know that wasn't a big deal hey, when you wrote uh, the giving sorrow words mm -hmm. uh, i'm sharing about that book a little bit more and, and how it really came about and you and you would guy work with um the author you, the co-author you helped out you see up to combine this book and share about the process from start to finish. And how long did you take to create this book? It took me several years. I actually had done a lot of research before Nancy came on board. And thank God she did. She's a fabulous writer. And um, and then she, <laughs> she and I researched together. We used to, <laughs> this is some of my stories, but I mean, you know, she would find people to interview. I would find people to interview. But I also traveled around the country going to uh, grief conferences, interviewing grief facilitators, counselors. Um, I'm a trained grief facilitator myself. And so, um, and then we would, you know, interview various people who had suffered, you know, tragedies in their life. I remember she, she was, we had a great time. Neither one of, we both smoked and we didn't smoke. So <laughs> we both didn't want to smoke at the time. And so we, you know, we would really try not to smoke, but we would go into some of these interviews and, we'd hear some of these horrendous stories and we'd walk out the door saying, where's the nearest bar and let's get a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> and I thank God it was her I worked with because we really had fun um, during some of this. So it, 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 like I said, it took me, I think it started it maybe a year or two before I found her. And then it took us a year of researching and working together and writing before it was done. So it was a long process. And, and really what motivated me is that it was, um, I left MAD and they had invited me, uh, I think, to a conference or not, but I went. And I was meeting the chapter leaders that I had known and we were all having lunch. And, and it was been, what, maybe five years since she had died, I think, at that point in time. And someone said to me, well, what have you been doing? And I said, well... I said, Matt dealt really well with my anger, but it didn't do well with my grief. So I have been seeing a psychologist to help me through the grieving process. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, for Pete's sakes, it's been five years. You should be over it. And now, by the way, this is somebody who hadn't, who, who nobody in her had died. And I looked at her and I, and I just looked at her and I said, where do you get off with that remark? And she said, well, you know, it comes in five phases, blah, blah, blah. And you should be done by now. And I went home and thought about this and I thought that is such BS. And so I did some research and I had read or did read Elizabeth Kubler's book on dying. And I thought, you know, this is absolutely wrong. People have got this very confused. And so I became really passionate about disbunking the myths, basically, and about letting people know that grief is a lifetime process. And it is. And, you know, people grieve for the rest. I mean, some people may not, but most people do in one capacity or another. And so I decided then that I wanted to write the book and I started doing research. And then the more research, the more passion I became. And then I went to my agent and said, um, I think I had been signed already a book on MAD, and then we decided not to do that. And so um, so I went and said, look, instead of the MAD book, I really want to do this book. And, and it actually went up for auction. It did. And so um, it's one of those timeless classic books that you can read forever that will never be out of style or trend. And so um, so anyway, we, we wrote the book. You know, we put it together and just uh, – 
a beautiful sharing of stories. I mean, I covered some of the most fascinating, interesting stories and met some of the most interesting people. And, uh, you know, I think I met I, one of the people I interviewed, both of his children had committed suicide and he was somebody actually who was a drug addict who had introduced them to drugs. Wow. I mean, we just heard that that was one of the ones where we said, where's the nearest bar? Uh, <laughs> we just, you know, we really uh, and, and I got very involved in the gay community at the time. And uh, that was fascinating in, uh, in and of itself, because this is years ago, of course. And so so many families had kind of, you know, just um, there's a word I want to use, but had, you know, sort of disowned uh, family members who were gay. And I would meet others after the son had died of AIDS, who um, had come together uh, after this happened and um, wanted to help others because they had basically disowned their children and then they died and, you know, who had felt terrible. And I had some of the most heart-wrenching stories. And I used to sit in on the grief groups there. I mean, it was just a, a, a whole different world at the time, thank God. And um, you know, we didn't have to deal with social media and all this crap, but um, so it was very real. You know, you were there, you were, you, you met people, you didn't do it via Zoom, et cetera. So it was just anyway. And um, yeah, put the book together and off it went. I know three uh, parents personally. My, my cousin lost her one-year-old, had two good oh. friends. Their kids died at a very, very young age. I, I agree with you. Grief uh, can stick around for a long, mm -hmm. long time. And memory those your kids, and I mean, I just, I just can't fathom someone saying that. It just, my skin just crawls right now. When you said that that person said it to you. I'm like, ah, that's just so, so heart wrenching. You know, Jody. I think too. Of course, nowadays there's so much material out there. So many books. So many organizations. Um, one of our partners, for example, uh, deals with grief and actually two or three of our partners do. There's, there's a much greater, you know, area of knowledge that people can look at and that, and it's possible somebody wouldn't say that today. And of course you've got social media and everybody's posting on Facebook stories or on Facebook, their stories of grief and pain. But yeah, back then, let me tell you something that was really prevalent, although people still do, and, and your family members may have heard still do and make some really insensitive remarks like time heals all wounds, you know, please. Yes. Um, and I don't like the term. I don't know how you feel about this. I don't like the term healing when it comes to grief. Grief isn't an illness. And I actually don't agree with the psychological association or whatever who declared that if you grieve longer than a year, it is. And so you can get insurance, whatever. I don't. It really is a lifetime process. Now, some people do grieve. Um, I, I, I don't want to use the word wrong because it really isn't wrong, but do have some serious issues with grief and they do need help. And I remember I went to my psychiatrist after Carrie died and I love this man. And he said to me, you know, I've never been through what you've been through and I can't understand the pain that you must be feeling. And so I am not the best person. And this was a psychiatrist. I am not the best person to work with you on this issue, but I would like to find you some who is, which, and I didn't go anymore because then I started mad and didn't have time, but I really appreciated the fact that he told me that and that he shared that with me. And ironically, this was the same man. Uh, my son was run over before Carrie died. And um, when he was four, was run over by a car in front of my house. And so um, he was in the car behind the woman who, who ran over my son. And she was an unlicensed driver on prescription. And so he stopped his car and jumped out. And my daughter came in and got me because the car had landed on top of my son and we had to get the car up off of him. Oh, and yeah. um, I know. And so, uh, and the ambulance was coming and everything. So he helped me and other kids joined in to help us get the car off Travis. And, and he rode with me to the hospital in the ambulance, an amazing man. And after, well, tr when Travis finally got home, which was like a month later, three weeks or a month later, in a coma, um, and they actually didn't expect him. To, 
he, I remember I was looking out the window and he, he had asked me one time what Travis liked. And I said, airplanes. And he brought over a, like a box of wooden airplanes that Travis could put together it, and just left them on the yard. He was so sweet. He didn't want to interrupt or disturb me or anything and took off. I didn't know him. He was a neighbor, but I didn't know him. And then until I started seeing a psychiatrist and then, um, which I was doing, he died. And, um, and so he was there after. Anyway, so uh, that's why I wrote the book. Is your book still available so people can can Absolutely. It? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Okay, awesome. And um, you have raised the legal driving age, to, I believe, if I'm correct, 18 to 21. And you met with my favorite president, Ronald Reagan. And he was what a sweet man. What was that process like? Oh, it was fascinating. We had, we were having a real problem at the time, which we call blood borders. And this is because different states had different ages for legality. So one state might be 19, one might be 18, one might be 20, one might be 21. I think California was 21, which is where I was. But anyway, so what was happening is teens were driving over from one state to another, crashing in and others at the border. And we thought, you know, we need to do something about this. And looked at it and decided, you know, the best thing to do would be to change the drinking age and make it equal. And then it came down to a choice of which age do we pick? Well, most of the states had 21. And that's why we decided to go with 21. It would have been a much easier process. And so uh, we asked the states, we had chapters all over um, at that time. And so in almost, I think we had them in every state. And so we went to our chapters in the states that had the lower drinking age and said, hey, can you get it raised to 21? Well, some of them were successful and some of them weren't. Hmm. And we just kept having problems after problems because of the alcohol lobby. So we decided then we would do it at the federal level and we would do a carrot and stick approach so that the states who passed funding the states who didn't wouldn't. And tried it one year and it didn't work and we had an author and it just didn't fly. And the second year we went back and, and really we had, um, God, Frank Lautenberg and, um, oh, this is horrible. I can't remember these people, but anyway, it was so long ago. Anyway, so we had, we had sponsors, but what we did first, is, oh, he was really famous speaker of the house. White hair. Newt? No. <laughs> That's all I can think of. <laughs> oh, no. Really famous. Um, oh, this is horrible that I can't think of his name. Why do I want to say? From Massachusetts, I think. And um, I'm going to look it up while I'm talking. And so uh, anyway, he was... Um, I mean, he was like, he was world famous. And so this was 1984. And so somebody said, you really should go back and meet whoever and talk to him because he can make it or break it. You know, he can basically say this, uh, Tip O'Neill. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it, you know, you, you've got to get his support. Well, the only day that I could get into via his schedule is May 3rd and that was the day she died that was the anniversary of her death and I usually didn't do things on that day so I was living in town and I thought well if this is the only day I'll go so I hopped in the plane and I met with um, Chuck Hurley who at that time was executive director I think of the national uh, it was of the National Safety Council I just don't remember if he was the lobbyist or executive director or what but um, and we met and I brought a lily with me because it was the death. And we went over to his office and she had been around for years and he really knew the ins and outs and what to do and what not to do. And I had done federal legislation. Maybe I had done one bill, but not like 21. So um, we were waiting for Tip to come off the floor and his assistant came up to us and said, I'm so sorry, he won't have time to meet you. And Chuck, remember I started to leave and Chuck said, don't you dare leave. And, 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 held on to me. So I didn't. 
And Tip comes running through the door. And there I am with a rose or, or with a lily, a big lily. And so, you know, obviously he's going to see me. And his assistant was said something like, oh, they were here, but they can't, they don't have time. And he was so drawn, you know, that he walked over and um, I introduced myself and he asked me, why are you carrying this lily? And I said, because my daughter was whatever it was, three years today or four years ago today. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, gave me a hug and said, come into my office. Oh, she's not happy, not happy. <laughs> so we go into his office and he's showing us his mementos and whatever. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want 21. He said, all right, you've got it. He took me in to meet his, I guess, legislative liaison or whomever, who also, this is my memory, um, <clears throat> that I remember didn't all had red hair and smoked a cigar and I don't and, and that's another story but anyway <laughs> and we went in there and I can't remember and he said oh blah 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 she wants 21 get it for her and so he, Chip walks out because he's got to go to Massachusetts we all say goodbye I never see him again and um, and so we worked with his person who whoever that was and um <laughs> this is it was really a, a whole different world you know, we were opposed by the alcohol industry and they were an incredibly powerful lobby at the time. Mm -hmm. And students, they had put a group of students, college kids, who also opposed us. And this is when, and again, I'm going to blank out on names, but he used to do that show um, that was on every night and I had such a crush on him. <laughs> what was that show that was on at 1130 at night, every night? Um, the talk show? Top of the night, talk of the night. Hang on two seconds. <laughs> because this will drive me nuts if I can't do this. Have a quick intermission. <laughs> okay, it was on ABC News. I, I've got a photo of him that he signed for me. Ted Koppel. Okay. And what was this show? Something like Top of the Night or Night, whatever, Ted Koppel. Night, anyway. Nightline? Nightline. Hey. So, yeah. So Ted used to have me on his show all the time. And so I was always on debating, you know, the kids and the alcohol industry and whatever. And, um, and you know, major media, People Magazine, 60 Minutes, et cetera, were following us around. And we had this map of the blood borders that we had of the states and where all the deaths occurred, you know, and we had highlighted in red, uh, which I would love to see again. But uh, the person that has it wanted me to pay money to get it, and I won't. Anyway, so we had this map that we would carry on and whenever the legislators would know that I was in literally, I mean, I had cameras on my back the whole time. If they knew there were cameras, they'd come running out, of course, you know, and say, oh, yes, yes. And we'd show them the map and they'd get all excited. Anyway, um, so we, we, this is when you, well, they're still doing it, but, you know, legislators would say, well, I'll support it if you'll add this and this, you know, and go. Yep. And so, you know, they'd reach, you know, yell at me or whatever up in the um, audience of the floor. And I'd, you know, be going, yes, no, whatever. I mean, <laughs> anyway, so this was going on for a while. And then uh, at about two or three in the morning, the somebody came in and grabbed Chuck and I and said, come with me. And so we did. And we went down in the tunnels and under the Capitol and doing all that exciting stuff, which I'd never done before. And we come to this room and it said, room and all these uh, legislative assistants are in there. I'm the only woman, by the way. And I, but at that time I was like 98 pounds, you know, five foot two. So um, we go down and he says, oh, here she is. God, I wish I could remember his name. The guy who smokes a cigar and tips legislative liaison or whatever. He goes, oh, here she is. Here she is, everybody. All right, let's get to work. Come on down, Candy. Come on down. So I'd go down, sit in the front row, which I was sleeping at the time. And so sorry about that. Hush, cuddles, hush. And so he would say, okay, Senator so whoever the person was for Senator so-and-so, hush. He'd say, okay, you know, what is your business? And he'd say, all right, Candy, are you going to go with that or not? And I'd say no, or I'll, yes, or, you know, can we do this? That's how it happened. That's exactly how it happened. Like six or seven in the morning, and I'd be sleeping in between on this bench. Um, they'd say, okay, we got it. And I got up, we all walked back, and we took the boat. And, and 
was. And I remember I went back home. I went back to the hotel. I was staying living in a hotel. Um, I went back to the hotel and the reporter started calling me at like the next morning at four o'clock in the morning. I was so tired. Four o'clock in the morning. And they'd be saying, how do you feel? And I'd be like, God, I'm tired. How do you think I feel? And <laughs> Um, yeah, it passed. And then, of course, we had the big signing with President Reagan. So I'll tell you about that because I absolutely love that man. So Elizabeth Dole is the one who really worked with us. I really love that woman and, and just have the utmost respect for her. She was so supportive and we were, climb, you know, sneaking into the White House, obviously, um, getting support when we needed support from various people and didn't want anybody else to know about it. And she would, you know, be sneaking in with me. But anyway, so... When it came time for the bill signing, um, I was up on the dais or whatever you call it with Reagan and Bush, her and Lautenberg. I can't remember the other sponsors. And I was standing behind President Reagan. And um, when I sit down to sign the bill, she pushed me down and, you know, to, to be over him, and which is the photo that was seen around the world. And so... He looked up at me, he had the pen in his hand and he looked up at me and he said, you know what, Candy, I don't think I'm going to sign this. And I said, President Reagan, if you don't sign it, I will. And, and everybody laughed and he signed it and gave me the pen. So anyway, it was very, very special, very special. And it saved thousands of lives. Yes, yes. And so in 2014, you founded We Save Lives. I did. How did We Save Lives come about? Well... I went to one of those conferences. Um, I was Lifesavers, which I don't go to anymore, but I did because I was a consultant at that time for a company that had a fluid device that tests for drugs when you're driving, you know, when they pull you over. And I, I love those devices and, um, and it gets you off the road. And so uh, I went to a conference and I started talking to all the various um not vendors exactly, but, you know, all the people that buy booths and set up booths. And I'd say, you know, hi, do you work with this group or do you work with that group? Or have you ever worked with this group? And I found nobody worked with any seriously. No, don't know them. Well, they're right over here. I went and I'd take them over and say, you know, they do some of the same stuff you do. You guys should work together. And I just saw this whole, um, I'm sure there's a cute and clever name for it, but way of being that, you know, people were just doing their own thing and not working with others. And I thought, you know, when I was at MED, we worked with everybody. I mean, that's no longer true there, but it was when I was there. And I thought, you know, people should be working together because mm -hmm. by working together, you accomplish more. And that's my opinion. So, um, and again, I started seeing the issue, well, I was seeing the issue of drug driving, which was becoming more and more prevalent and with absolutely no attention being given to it and more of an interest in legalizing marijuana rather than dealing with the issue of drug driving. And I thought, hmm, and then distracted driving was becoming, um, you know, a bigger deal. And I actually was invited by Ray LaHood, who was the NITS administrator at the time, to come to a conference to talk to some of the people who had been impacted by distracted driving about how they could do something similar to men. And so, um, and since then, I myself have been impacted. I actually have a broken back as a result of a distracted driver. So I just started seeing these issues and I realized that MAD wasn't doing much on drunk driving anymore, except for um, technology issues and passive this and um, and and working with victims, but they really weren't dealing with the issue of drunk driving in the way that I felt needed to be addressed. And so, and, and unfortunately, a lot of laws have been rescinded, but anyway, so I thought, you know, hmm, maybe I should do this. And then I went to a, a MAD conference and I met with a lot of the people, not MAD people that were there, but people outside of MAD that were there that said, boy, we wish, you know, we wish you'd come back and have you thought about, you know, doing this again? And so I actually talked it and said, what do you think? And they thought it was a great idea. And I said, well, I'm thinking of starting like a, a partner organization. I would never do another MAD in a million years. And, um, but, you know, trying to bring groups together to work together on different projects. And they thought that was a great idea. And that's what I did. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
I was also reading you co-founded the Drop the A movement. Can you share? Oh yeah, Drop the A word. Yeah. So when I was at Mad years ago, I did that. We didn't call it Drop the A word, but I couldn't stand the word. I mean, just think of my daughter's death. You know, she was hit by a five-time multiple repeat offender. She was left in the road to die. She was thrown 125 feet, and yet they called it an accident. It's not. Wow. So I, I would say, no, this is a crash and a crime. And most people don't think of drunk driving as a crime and it is. And so um, I, you know, so we had this whole thing going and then it disappeared after I left. And so I started realizing after I started, um, we people were using the word accident again, which I did not, nor would I, and nor, and I would also tell people that I worked with, et cetera, including me they do interviews. No, we don't call this an accident. So I was at a conference and I can't think of his name, but he writes for the New York Times. And he was, he had written a book of which I was in about, I think it was distracted driving and he had used the word accident. So this panel was set up. He uh, was talking and others were talking and they're all using the word accident. And I was getting really frustrated and so at the end, when they asked for questions, I raised my hand and I said, how can you use the word accident and went through my thing? And they said, oh, you know, you're right, you're right, you're right. Well, Jeff um, Larison was there and he was with a, a, a different group at the time. And he said, yes, I was going to say the same thing. Well, each other and said, let's get together. And we did. And we decided to launch the Drop the A Word movement, and um, which is eliminating the word accident. And actually, we've gotten legislation passed in California um, that takes it out of all bills dealing with drunk drugs and distracted driving. And I, and I heard, I think it was Massachusetts just did it. And some other states have done it. We got the AP um, what do you, AP press thing to make the recommendation uh, going forward that people need to, the reporters to really rethink how they use the word accident because in many cases it's really not an accident. And um, we've gotten major newspapers to change their stories and articles written about it and whatever. And so, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing campaign of We Save Lives, drop the A word. As I was reading about you, I, I believe you also initiated a petition to for driving, uh, like your drive mode on your phones. Oh that- yeah, we, we got Apple to do that. I take I, the credit so, for I'm it. So, I'm, I'm so I was just reading about you. I'm like, she's the one to help do like the drive mode on my phone. <laughs> yeah. Now I can, honestly have to tell you, I don't know. Oh hush. Oh, sorry. Every time, hang on. I have to shut the curtains. Or every time you see somebody walk by, you have to know he's here. No, I'm just chiming in. <laughs> I'm on the phone. You can't do that. No, you can't. Um, so, okay, so that was, you know, I noticed you had it for planes and we didn't have it for cars. And I started thinking, how dumb is this? <laughs> so I tried to get a hold of people. Hush, hush. I tried to get a hold of people at Apple, which, you know, I wasn't successful. I don't know why they wouldn't take my call. Um, to find out, you know, what they were doing or if they were doing anything. And so I thought, well, screw this. I'm just going to start a petition. So I did. Mm. And um, and in the meantime, we, you know, would petition them and, and tag them on social media and people would call them. And so they knew what we were doing. And then they did. They they um, added on onto the cell phone. So I do. I take credit for it. What the heck, you know. That's that's just a, 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 amazing. I'm really, I'm just uh, amazed that you you've done so many different things. Uh, also, hashtag but not while driving can. Oh yeah. So Jody, if you haven't done this, do this. This um, <sighs> cuddles. Hush, <laughs> hush. This was a campaign we started several years ago. Distracted driving groups would say to me, not all, but a bunch would say to me, how do we make it socially unacceptable? You know, why, how can we do what you do or what you did with drunk driving? So I started thinking about it and I thought, well, what if we had a message that everybody could see that lets everyone know that we, whoever, you know, we are, um, that we don't consider it socially acceptable and that we don't do it and really don't want them to do it. So 
um, I came up with, but not while driving, hashtag, but not while driving. And so we did a big campaign asking everybody to add hashtag, but not while driving on their mobile device signature. And you'll see it on mine. If I ever use my mobile device, you'll see. And I get a lot of compliments. Well, I was at, I, I lecture at um, Columbia University at the Leadership Institute and now through the Mentor Institute. And um, well, so I was lecturing there and I, before I launched this publicly and I was talking to all the, these are MBA and post MBA students. And I said, Hey, look, you know, if I asked you to do hashtag, but not while driving, is this something you would do? And, you know, cause that's where I get a lot of my brainstorming ideas actually from these young people at the Mentor Institute. And so um, sure enough, I, I, got a message from Dubai on something totally from one of the guys who lives in Dubai, come from all over the world, totally unrelated. And I saw a hashtag, but not all driving on his phone. I was like, yay. And that's when I thought, well, we need to do a big campaign on this and get everybody to do this. And so um, we put together a great group of volunteer people. I mean, marketing people, advertising people, et cetera and um, launched it as a campaign, hashtag, but not while driving. And I don't know that that has gone over as big as some of the other things. We did a video, I don't know if you've seen it, but if not, you should, Reflections from Inside, which has been seen by hundreds of millions of people around the world and transcribed into more than 27 languages. And in fact, I was just asked by, it's in Australia, I think a group in Australia, if they could use it for a program they're putting together. I mean, police use it, um, victim impact people use it, et cetera. And this came to us from a major advertising agency that at the time was called Young and Rubicon YNR. And they had contacted us. They put together some videos on distracted driving and saw that we did that and contacted me and said, hey, we've done these pro bono. You can use them, whatever. I thank them. I was in Florida at the time, and so were they. And then um, they sent me a few other things that they did and I put them up and then they gave me a call and said, you know, we'd really like to do something about drunk driving. And what would you think if we did something with a convicted felon? And I, it's, we always do it with victims. And so I said, gee, I don't know. I'm not sure that's a good idea. And I had to think about it. And then I called them back and I said, you know, why not? Because we've been doing it with victims for so long. And I'm just not sure that those stories have the same impact they did 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Right. It took us a year to put this together to find the right um, young man who had been convicted of killing a police officer and four children. This was in, turns out, we looked around the country, but the young man we found. And um, it's called Reflections Inside, and it's actually filmed of him at prison. And he, um, I'm the executive producer on the video, and what we did is we had him speak to people through a mirror in a bar bathroom in Los Angeles. Actually, the bar was getting ready to close down, which is why we were able to film there. And, uh, and so when the guy go in, you know, to use the restroom and they'd look up to wash their hands, there was Chris. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And if you haven't seen it, see it and saying, Hey, what are you drinking? Whatever. And, you know, I, that, I used to like that drink and, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then talk about what he did and, um, you know, and the reactions would be, wow. Or, you know, some people said, well, I'm using a designated driver, but it was really, really impactful. We launched video. Oh, Jody, you should have seen the comments on Facebook. I mean, we had so many, I think we almost broke our Facebook page down, but <laughs> things like Mary, I told you not to do this. And Mary would respond and say, Oh my God, you're right. I won't. I'll never drink and drive again. I mean, this would be all the way through it. People would be sending it to four and five and six other people who drank and drove. I mean, it was so impactful. Whereas did the video on drugged driving. It was just the opposite. Oh, well, dude, half the people that responded, no, most of them couldn't spell. You know, oh, this is a lie. This is a hoax. Oh, you know, drug driving drug to safer than, oh, whatever. I mean, it was such a difference. I mean, it was such a difference. Anyway, incredibly impactful. In fact, one of the guys that I knew 
um, who was a state uh, Nebraska Office of Traffic Safety, I sent it to him. I said, hey, do you mind you know, putting this on your Twitter or whatever? And he said, sure. <laughs> Within minutes, seriously, minutes, he emailed me. Oh my God, this thing has more than a hundred shares and we've only had it up for like a minute or two. <laughs> Just unbelievable, unbelievable. I had so many requests from other countries. Can we transcribe it? There were countries I didn't even know existed and I've lived all over the country in the world. And I'm like, whoa. That's um, amazing. Yeah. And we'll discuss quickly the National Passenger Safety Week again. I just want to get some more people to understand what this is about. Do you mind sharing a little bit? So deaths and injuries have been going up instead of down, except for maybe the first six months of, or the last six months of last year, possibly. Um, and, and it only went down, at like, I forget what it was, two-tenths of a percent or two percent or something, but it's been going up. And through the pandemic, mind you, going up. And the reason it's been going up is from distracted driving and speeding. And we've been giving messages all the time. Drivers don't drive drunk, don't blah, 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 you know. And I don't, nobody's listening anymore, it's my opinion. So I really felt we needed to do something different. And I started thinking, who has the most influence on a driver? It's the passenger. Mm -hmm. So 30%, these stats are from a while ago, but 30% of drivers with drunk drivers that were killed, you know, were killed in drunk driving crashes were passengers, et cetera looking at these stats and there was a guy from NHTSA who unfortunately has since died who was really helpful to me and he had retired from NHTSA who also believed passionately in this and sent me a lot of information. So I would go out and I would like at Mentor and this is where it came up. I said to everybody, you know, how many of you, when, if you say how many of you drive drunk, whatever, how many, I stopped saying that and I would say, how many of you have ridden with somebody who's drunk? You know, hands would go up. How many of you ridden with somebody who's drugged? And they'd say legal or I'd say both hands would go up, uh, but not as many. Drunk, very few. Drugged, there, there were a number. And how many of you ridden with somebody distracted? And everybody's hand went up. And I went, why? And I started in, and we would do role playing and all this stuff. And I started thinking, this needs to go worldwide. This, you know, we need to talk to passengers. So for probably almost two years during the pandemic, I had this as an, a, a thought for a campaign, and I limited financially, et cetera, and it's a small organization. And I started thinking, you know, I need a partner for this. And I went to National Road Safety Foundation, whom I dearly love them, they're good friends, and said, is this something you'd be interested in? And they took some time in thinking about it. And as a pandemic, it's not ending, but as you know, the, the um, stigma and the restrictions started ending. Mm -hmm. They came back and said, yes, we would. And we decided that was like in September, decided to launch it last. And Michelle, actually, from uh, the National Road Safety Foundation is the one who found the one week in which nothing was happening. You know, it was like, we need to find a week in which no, and the only week was the last week in January. Wow. And so we launched it. We had over 50 partners. Now we've got, I think, over 60. Um, major social media campaign, did a lot of media around the country on it, all talking about passenger safety, what passengers need to do. Bad kids put together some great videos that, you know, young people can look at and get ideas of how to handle situations. Now they've got TikTok things going up. And um, uh, anyway, it's just become a major deal. NHTSA put it on their calendar. Um, I was hoping to get in to see the Secretary of Transportation about it, but that hasn't happened. However, um, you know, we've just got a lot going. And so this year it will be the 22nd to the 28th. Um, we've already got our campaigns sort of put together, and so we'll be launching them on the 22nd. But the big message here, everybody, is we need to empower passengers to speak up and save their life. Yeah. So if you see somebody who's drunk, don't get in the car. Try and keep them from driving drunk. If you can't, at least don't get in the car. The same is true of drugged. And if somebody's driving and all of a sudden they want to talk on their Bluetooth, which is dangerous, or their cell phone, you need to say, let me handle the call. Um, I happen to love me and I love you. I want to live. So let me handle the call. I mean, I make this clear before I get into a car. I will not get into a car with you if you're going to use your cell phone. Uh, my friends don't drink and drive, but they do cell phone use. So I have to make that really clear. And if you keep them from driving distracted, you'll live and so will they. I know for me, it's, it's, 
I I've been doing my best to just ignore it, put the hide the put the phone away, <laughs> and it's so distracting just seeing little notifications pop up, and I'm like just just put the phone in my pocket or somewhere else see it, and that way I can just concentrate on the road. Well, you know, do your drive mode. Yes, yes. You can put drive mode on; it's fine. And a lot of people say to me, "But I need." Um... Google Maps or whatever you call it, Google Maps. And I say, and so did I, but I would have it talk to me. I would have the phone down. I wouldn't look at it. It would say, turn right here, turn left there. And I, if I got confused, I would pull into the nearest parking lot. I'd look at the map, blah, 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 put it down. And I know people that say, well, I only look at my messages on at stop signs. Well, it takes you an average of 27 seconds after you stop the car to refocus back on your driving. People don't multitask. They think you do, but you don't. Yeah. And so um, the safest, look, no phone call is worth a life. And you, I don't know how old you are, but I'm old. And, you know, I lived the majority of my life without a cell phone. Thank God. Didn't need it. And nobody died because I couldn't get a phone call within 30 seconds. So, you know, the thing people need to realize is that's not worth someone's life or injury. You know, just put it away, turn on drive mode and wait till you get home. I'm only half old. I'm 52. So I'm, I'm half old. <laughs> oh, half old. <laughs> <Be on there. laughs> uh, you've been honored with all kinds of awards. Uh, top 100 women in America, the presence of volunteer action. Uh, so many awards. What do these awards mean to you? You know, it's interesting. The only, there was only two awards I actually worked for. And one was the one you mentioned that's on my, pinned on my thing. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I think it was the top, whatever, 20 women or 10 women or something. And I did work for that award. And the one for GHSA, the Governor's Highway Safety Association, because that was for my peers. Mm -hmm. And that was really important to me. Not, I mean, the awards, the awards are all meaningful and I'm grateful for all of them. Um, I wouldn't mind the Pulitzer Prize um, because <laughs> it would be nice to win the Pulitzer Prize. I mean, I changed the culture of a nation. I'm credited with saving a thousand lives but you know unfortunately crash prevention and highway safety isn't a big deal to these people so you know and nobody's ever gotten an award or honored at the kennedy center for doing anything about highway safety unfortunately right. um so you know they're they're all meaningful because of the intent behind the award and the people they came from and you know they're nice to have and absolutely appreciate them and i'm grateful and you've inspired positive uh, community action all over the world. Do you think, in your opinion, enough is being done today to fight against destructive drunk driving? No, I don't. We don't have, I, and this is, I'm the only activist. Well, maybe there's one or two others, but I'm really, I don't see activism at all. I see advocacy, mm. but there is a difference. And advocacy is incredibly important, but these people usually work within the system to get things done. Activists like myself work outside the system. You know, we set the system blaze. And so I just don't see that anymore on this issue. And except for me and I'm older and I don't have that same kind of um, motivation on some of the things I do, like my next thing after passenger safety, I think is going to be server training because we're not doing enough of it. We're not doing it in some areas. So and we need to train servers to be responsible if they're serving alcohol. But, you know, I get passionate about a certain aspect of it and then I, I go for it. But I just don't see activism as a, as a player. And that's unfortunate. We need far more activists. I love your quote. Complaining about a problem is meaningless. Finding a solution is meaningful. Very solution oriented. I, I just won't work with people who want to complain unless they have a solution. Just won't do it. As I'm beginning to wrap up, I, uh, again, thank you for your time. I came across a program uh, that that cops are driving semi trucks to see higher and is, uh, catching people doing on their phones and curling their hair and all kinds of weird things. I thought that was so cool seeing cops drive semis to get a better, better perspective on distracted driving. I believe it. I've, I've had people call me and tell me they've seen people having sex while driving. Oh, man. I know. Seriously. God, can't you wait? People are so obsessed with themselves. As we close up, one final question. Would you mind sharing some encouraging words with someone out there who may be been, you know, debating on doing something, make action for something? What can you share with somebody to, to move forward and to, to stand for something they truly believe in? 
Well, you know, there's so many resources now on Google. Um, I have a client right now who's starting a movement because her son um, was killed by fentanyl. And it's amazing how many resources there are um, that can help guide you. And I'm actually putting together a course on activism for the Mentor Institute, which hopefully is almost done. So, um, but if, if there's something, you know, if you see a problem and, um, and, and, you, and nobody is doing anything about it, you know, take the first step. But the first thing I do advise people is look and see if someone is doing something about it. And if they are, help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very true. Candace, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate getting to know you and getting to meet your story and sharing your story. And I wish you nothing but continued success in all you do and, and fighting for so many lives out there. And just thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you, Jody. Stay safe and well. Yes, ma'am. God bless. Take care. Hi, I'm Candace Leitner, founder of We Save Lives. Sadly, I know all too well how deadly driving impaired can be. My daughter, Carrie, was killed by a drunk driver. That led me to start Mothers Against Drunk Driving. By speaking out, we changed attitudes and reduced fatalities. It's a mission I'm still deeply committed to. Through We Save Lives, I'm working to make our roads and you safer. Did you know that 25% of those killed in crashes are passengers? That's why we're partnering with the National Road Safety Foundation to deliver an important message. If you're with someone who's driving dangerously, you need to speak up. Yes, for many of us, that can be difficult, but lives may depend on it. To get some tips on how to speak up, visit nationalpassengersafety.org and sign the Courage to Intervene promise. Ask your friends and family to sign too. We'll return to the Chin Chat and encourage you one of the podcast after these messages. Are you craving some authentic, fresh Mexican food? I got two places for you. Are you ready? You got a pen and paper? One, Dequiza Street. It's a mobile food truck located in Silverdale, Washington at 9571 Silverdale Way. They have some of the best breakfast burritos I've ever eaten. My favorite is the barbecued pulled pork burrito. They have other Mexican items as well. But burritos, breakfast burritos are there are amazing. You can reach them at 360-914-9152. That's Takiza Street. Also, at the Kitsap Mall in Silverdale, Washington, there's Takiza. There, they have over five kinds of tacos, burritos, chimichangas, and my favorite there, grilled jalapenos. Delicious. I know, I'm getting you hungry, right? Either Tequiza Street or Tequiza, and their number at the mall is 360-698-4335. Roberto and his staff are amazing. They're friendly, and their food is delicious. Come on by. Check them out. That's Tequiza Street at 9571 Silverdale Way in Silverdale. Or Tequiza at the Kids at Mall in Silverdale. 360-698-4335. I'm telling you, they got some of the best Mexican food in Kitsap County. It's locally owned and operated and very, very good. See you there. Craving donuts? Craving fresh made daily donuts? Lone Star Donuts. They have over 50 flavors. Sprinkles, no sprinkles. Field, not filled. Chocolate, glazed, maple donuts with real bacon. Snow rolls. They are so good. So light and so fluffy. These are not your normal donuts. These are Texas style donuts. If you know what 
been to Texas, nothing small in Texas. Go see my friends at Lone Star Donuts. Now with two locations. One in Silverdale, Washington at 1087 Maury Place. That phone number is 360-204-5021 in Silverdale. Or Port Orchard at 2649 Mile Hill Drive. Their number there is 360-443-2600. You can find them on Facebook as well. Lone Star Donuts. Life is happier with donuts. Donuts from Lone Star Donuts. This is the Chris Jones Band, always here on the Chit and Chat Encouraging One Other Podcast.
This is my good friend Steve Almond featuring Annie O'Neill, Cold Wet Ashes. Jason Biddle, I need you now. The gates are open, I can't do it no more. Desperate and broken, my knees hit the floor. I have tried to do it on my own. Burdens at 
your feet I see the cross I start to feel Thank you so much for joining the podcast today as I got the chance to interview the founder of MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and now the founder and president of We Save Lives, Candace Leitner. Incredible story she has gone through and how she started these amazing organizations, as well as we had great music by Chris Jones Band, uh, Steve Atman, and Annie O'Neill, and Jason Biddle. Their amazing music and songs. This podcast is here to encourage others to have fun conversations with anybody and everybody and just kind of share their story. I have some amazing guests lining up here throughout the month of January, February, March, and uh, we're going to keep this going as long as we can in hopes to encourage somebody somewhere. If you like this, if the first time you're listening, subscribe and follow. You can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, and other podcasting platforms. Thank you again for joining the Chit and Chat Encouraging One Other Podcast. What it's always about, encouraging others. Have a great day. Talk to you next week. This is Chit and Chat, the encouraging one other podcast. What it's all about, encouraging others. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.